I'm from Canada. I'm from Alberta originally, and we're known for tar sands and also Nickelback. And they're both terrible <laughs> things, and I'm sorry for both. Um, so yeah, that's all you need to know about me. I'm going to be talking about oil spills and a bit of the bioremediation where they come together. So. Hey. And Nickelback. And no Nickelback. No Nickelback. Yeah. I'm Lexi. It's really a pleasure to be here. I flew in from Ecuador to come to this conference. And um, to be speaking alongside Maya and Lila right now is really exciting because the last time I saw Lila was five years ago when I went to a course that they were that Maya and Mia Maltz, who's not here, and Lila were, were putting on. And I, was, and I was sitting listening to them and was really inspired about bioremediation. And I ended up going to visit Ecuador shortly after. And I ended up falling in love with the, the ecosystem and the country and the culture and a human. And I've been living there five years since. And so this is the first time I've seen Lila since that course five years ago. And now we're teaching together. And it's really, awesome. <laughs> really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I'm also the field coordinator of Co Renewal. And we have a family project in Ecuador about um, um, reforestation and uh, conservation in, in the Ecuador in the Ecuadorian Amazon, and, um, and we also have a mushroom cultivation laboratory, which I'm going to get into all that. So thanks for your time. Awesome. So we have about an hour and a half for this session. You can all hear me, right? I can talk really loud. I just am trying to be chill. Um, and so we're going to start off, we're going to talk about oil spills for a little bit, um, because also a lot of people want to do remediation work, but they don't always understand how oil works or how oil spills work. And again, I said this yesterday, if you're trying to do any kind of healing work with the land and water, but you don't actually understand what's happening in terms of the mechanism of injury, it might not line up. And so I like to give people that kind of basis um, with oil spills. And also, a lot of us live by railroads, by coasts, by roads, by pipelines, and the chance of an oil spill happening in a community either that you live in or near you is pretty high. And so it's good to know how to advocate for yourself and also for the land in that situation. Then we're going to move into bioremediation, a quick intro, and then Maya's going to talk more deeply about microremediation and fungi, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who love fungi. Um, and then Lexi's going to take it home with talking more deeply about Ecuador and the work that's been happening there. Sound good? You guys want to know about oil spills? Because I can race through it or I can go, I can go normal slow. Normal. normal. For you. Okay. <laughs> um, can, you, can you make this work for time? So just um, those pictures, just kind of getting started. There's like different ways that, I mean, this whole session is about oil and also the remediation part. And the stuff that Lexi's going to be talking about is more, if you look at like the bottom uh, left hand corner, these kind of pits full of oil waste and oil sludge. And that's often left behind by industries in places where they think no one's gonna make them clean it up, right? Like indigenous communities, um, African American communities, things like that, all over the global south, right? Um, the pictures that you see around it, the top picture is the Exxon Valdez spill, which is one of the most iconic oil spills that happened up in Alaska and North America. And a lot of oil spill cleanup kind of was shaped by both that spill and also on the right hand, the Gulf, the BP Gulf spill. Um, the Deep Horizon spill that happened in Louisiana. And then that's, uh, I think, the Kalamazoo pipeline spill. So you can go. Um, a few things just to know about oil spills. Um, what's important is when you're thinking about any kind of remediation, you need to understand what kind of oil you're working with. Is it light oil? Is it medium oil? Is it heavy oil? So if you have a, an issue with something like jet fuel or a diesel spill, that's a completely different scenario than if you're working with a tar sands pipeline spill. And it's because those oils will react differently, right? If you're dealing with jet fuel, what we call like the light kind of oils or hydrocarbons, basically a lot of it will evaporate. And then some of it will actually, you know, get into the land or sink, but a lot of it evaporates. And so then you have to think about, are people breathing it in in the first 24 hours? What's going on with that? It also reacts differently with wildlife as well. And often with this, industry will say to us that, <laughs> this is awesome. Um, <laughs> keep running, little buddy. Um, industry will say, oh, it's a diesel fuel spill or it's a jet fuel spill. We don't have to worry about cleaning it up because it's all going to evaporate. That's a common myth that people say, and it's not entirely true. And the stuff that does stay behind, you do need to watch. It is actually fairly toxic. So you need to know how to read between the lines when government and industry is telling you things that aren't real. Um, but it is, a lot of it does evaporate, but that's not the entire story. Bitumen is a whole other thing, like tar sands, it sinks. 
A part of it evaporates, what we call volatile organic compounds will evaporate and give people all sorts of kind of health issues. But then a whole other part of it will sink and become submerged in land, in water. And so again, you're kind of remediating a different thing. Another thing with oil spills is how quickly they are responded to and contained makes a huge difference in their impact to the environment. And what we often see is companies, no one wants to take ownership of a spill, especially if there's a bunch of pipelines or you're in like a port, there's a thing where the boat is like, is it my spill? I don't know, is it your spill? And so while they're waiting to be like, who's liable for the spill, it's spreading on the water, right? It's getting into the river. And if they had actually acted immediately and contained it, they could have cleaned it up a lot more effectively. But because of kind of corporate liability, PR, everything, if you don't get on it fast enough, you cause way more damage. So that's huge. If you can contain it quickly, you're doing great. The other thing people need to think about is where is it gonna go and what kind of damage it's gonna do. So a land spill versus an open spill versus a river spill versus a lake spill are totally different scenarios, right? And it's a lot easier to kind of capture oil or work with it on the land than it is out on the open water. That's a whole other can of worms, especially for bioremediation, it's, it's different. But what often starts out on the ocean will end up on the shore. Right? So then as a remediator, you're thinking, where do I intervene in this? I'm not going to be throwing mycelium from a boat in the Gulf of Mexico on the water. I'm going to hit it on the shore. Right? So it's just thinking that through. Other things to think about is if you're doing water stuff, what are the currents, the tides, the waves? That can make a lot of things not work in your favor. Weather conditions. We have oil spills that basically happen or are exasperated by natural disasters. By extreme rain events, following an oil spill will make it spread that much farther. Things like Hurricane Harvey cause so much contamination in that way. Temperature, if you're in a cold climate, that oil is going to take a lot longer to break down in terms of remediation than if you're in a warmer climate, right? So Alaska versus the Gulf of Mexico did fairly differently in terms of even bacterial activity. Geology of your shoreline and the landscape makes all the difference. Is it sand? Is it rock? What kind of soil it is? Um, and then there's something people talk about a lot is when a spill happens, what is happening on the land? If it times out when all your whales are migrating or the salmon are spawning or it's calving season for something, you're in trouble, right? In terms of the impact will be that much stronger felt. If you luck out and it's like some weird biological wasteland moment, like no one's making out, no one's eating, no one's nesting, you're good, right? Um, health impacts and socioeconomic, again, where it happens, who it impacts, is it upstream from a community, will all influence how they clean it up and also the impacts that it has. And industry is often trying to think about this, but they don't always do that good a job. Another few things to think about, as I said, what the oil does, if it hits the surface of water, it tends to stay on the top of the surface, like a sheen, right? If it's a heavy oil, it'll more quickly start to kind of hit the bottom and kind of get to the, the shore, not the shore, get to kind of the, the sedimentation kind of phase. If it's kind of hanging out on the water, if a company takes too long to clean it up and it's just hanging out um, on river or water, it starts to do something called emulsification. Um, and we'll show that a picture of that. And also, again, there's two different parts of oil that you're kind of looking at in terms of contaminants. You're looking at PAHs, which are polycyclical aromatic hydrocarbons, and then VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds. VOCs kind of evaporate, and these are things like benzene. And when people are kind of coming up to a spill and they're getting headaches and they're feeling nauseous and all this stuff, that's the things like the benzene that they're kind of breathing in. And then the PAHs do a bit of that too, but they tend to also be left in the soil, in the land. So those are just different pieces. And these are just some pictures. So this on the, I guess the far right, um, that brown stuff is what they call mousse. The oil industry likes to make things sound better than they actually are. And they're like, look at that chocolate mousse, otherwise known as emulsified oil. Um, and so that's oil that's kind of like been agitated by the water and it's kind of grown in mass and become frothy and delicious. Um, then below, you have tar balls. If oil is kind of, again, left too long, it can actually form these tar balls. And in the Gulf of Mexico, after the BP spill, they were literally sifting the sand and picking out tar balls from the sand. They can also form tar mats, which is almost like asphalt. And so in the case of the Exxon Valdez, they did some weird stuff with cleaning it up where they actually forced the oil under the sand and made these like almost like mats of tar. And the problem with that is it'll just stay there. Like it's really hard for bacteria and stuff to break down a tar mat. So you end up with these like little asphalt things. So just things to notice. Um, I want to talk a bit about conventional because some of the remediation we think about in terms of bioremediation, we can base off some of their techniques in conventional oil, but this is the stuff that if you have an oil spill near you, you need to watch out for, you need to think about, because even if they do it all right, if it's an open ocean spill, the chance of them recovering the oil at like best is like 20, 30%. 
depending on the weather conditions. The rest, to them, they're just trying to cover the stuff they can see. If it hits the ground, if it goes under the water, they're like, we're cool. If it evaporates, they're like, that's awesome. As long as it's not hitting the shore and oiling a bird, it doesn't really count in terms of public relations. So I'm gonna go through these different ones. Two things I wanna bring up, natural attenuation and big bioremediation. So industry does do these things. Natural attenuation is just a fancy word for saying nature can handle it. So that's when they basically did as much as they could and then they just say, we're gonna let nature do it. And sometimes that's not a bad thing to do if you're in a very sensitive environment where actually going in and physically maneuvering and disrupting stuff could make it worse. So I think they talk about natural attenuation in like really fragile marsh ecosystems. Um, but again, it's sometimes a ploy to be like, we're done, we don't spend any more money, we're gonna let the earth handle it. Big bioremediation is they literally find ways to augment the bacteria that are maybe present, hoping that they'll break it down. And under that, it's like spraying fertilizer on a beach to feed the bacteria. They have a feeding frenzy. They eventually eat the oil. There's stuff like that. It's not always good for the land when they do that. But there are some interesting case studies where it's, it's been all right, but they can use some toxic things to do that. And then there can be impacts to people's health, right? So that's important to also note. Keep going. Yeah. So containment, when people talk about containing oil, that's a boom. Have people heard about booms before? It's just basically, it sits on the water on the ground. Um, and it has like a bit of a lip under it. And so what it's supposed to do is oil floats on water, at least in the beginning, and it's supposed to keep the oil from moving. The problem with containment though is if, the, if there's too much, I guess, wave action or actual um, tide and the kind of movement, it can go under the boom. So there's only a certain situation where it works. Next one. Booms and skimmers, this is an example of what you do more in a river, it's called like a boomerang. And that's where they, because they know that there's more kind of speed going on, they have a boom, and then they actually have like what they call a sorbent, like a material that's after it to kind of catch the oil that might slip under the boom. Um, that's a picture on the other side from uh, the, I think it's, oh, I don't, it looks like Vancouver actually. I thought it was like BP, but it's not. Um, the cool thing, or this is actually not cool, but a lot of oil spill cleanup conventionally is actually made with oil things. So if you look at all the booms and stuff, they're all made out of plastic and hydrocarbons. All the sorbents, which is stuff they stop the oil up, are made out of hydrocarbons. It's just like a plastic hydrocarbon love fest, which is awkward. Um, the other thing they do is once they contain the oil, they find ways to stop up the oil. So vacuum trucks, this is a picture from Michigan from the Kalamazoo spill. This was a tar sands bitumen spill. So they basically corral it and then they kind of are sucking it out of the water, trying to recover it, right? Next one. This is a spill that I worked on because I'm from Canada. Nobody here probably knows where Saskatchewan is, but it's our Kansas. Oh, 10 points for all of you. Um, it is not well known in Canada. There's a joke, there's a lot of jokes about Saskatchewan, but basically there was a spill there and it started on land. And I don't know if you can read down there, but the leak, the, basically they found a leak in the river at 8 p.m. on Wednesday and they didn't even turn off the pipeline till the next morning. No. Because everyone was like, is it mine? Is it yours? Whose is it? And if you're the first one to say it's mine, you have to handle all the cleanup. Right? And so they were all like, mm. and in that time, basically the spill started here and it moved all the way down here. And what was interesting is this is a city, a very small, boring city, this is a city, and they actually couldn't use their drinking water for multiple days. But the company was saying, oh no, it all stopped here, we got it all. Right? And then finally it came out that it had gone all the way up here with the river, because there was also a big rain event that kind of made things move. And then there was indigenous communities all along this way who were saying, we actually are seeing oil in the water. And the government was like, no, it's not there. And the industry wasn't testing it. If you don't test it, it's not true. And so me and a colleague of mine got actually hired to go up and down the river, meet with communities, test the oil and test the water and kind of be like, where is it actually happening? And one community actually brought in sniffer dogs because you can use dogs to kind of smell oil to actually be like, it's here. And then they were able to get some justice and some cleanup, right? But there's a whole thing of like, whose is it? It's not mine. Right? Um, Enbridge Kalamazoo, just again, a really good example of they're containing it, they're trying to suck it up. Um, but again, that was a tar sand spill. So if a company says we contained it and we're gonna sop it up, but it's tar sands and it sinks, that doesn't work, right? And same thing with a lot of the tar sands tankers. And so there was a lot of submerged oil with Kalamazoo and it's still there, right? Um, and then those paper towels you see are these like plasticky things called sorbents that sop up oil and then they throw it in garbage bags and send it to landfills. So. Um, another great thing they love to do is burn the oil and so they basically corral the oil with a boom and then they light it on fire because again they're trying to make sure it doesn't hit the shore or hit a whale or hit your beach but if it goes up into the sky boom rainbows and this is not awesome because it actually is air pollution it actually moves the toxins in a different way and in the Exxon Valdez bill they were doing this upwind of communities 
where people were also getting really sick and they weren't telling elders or pregnant folks to evacuate or anything because they pretend it's all fine. Um, I think that might have shifted after that controversy, but there was a lot of folks in the Gulf who were actually right around this when it was happening on the water who were taking it in in terms of the breathing, right? So that's not good. They will do this in terms of open ocean, Arctic, and again, things like marshes, they're like, this is where we do it because we don't want to get in there and physically cause damage, but we're just going to light it on fire. And when it's done burning, it does get rid of a lot of the oil, but the stuff that's left is a very kind of toxic resin that will sink. So dispersants. So this is my, I hate dispersants, but uh, this is a huge thing where you basically spray a certain kind of chemical on the oil slick. And what it's supposed to do is oil again floats and that can look bad if it like hits your shoreline or there's some birds that get slopped by oil. But if you spray this chemical on it, and it's, a, it's a class of chemicals, what it'll do is take the oil at the surface and kind of make it go into the water body, like into the whole water column. It dissolves it. And some of the thinking behind it is that if you dissolve it, it basically means that it's smaller particles and bacteria are more able to break it down, but it makes a problem at the surface become a problem for everything. In, and the dispersants themselves are highly toxic. In the BP Gulf spill, they basically did, they've never done this before, but they were actually spraying it at the wellhead. They usually spray it from the air and they sprayed it right at the wellhead. And what happened was all that oil basically went kind of on the bottom of the Gulf. And then all this bacteria tried to break it down and made this weird mucus slime on top of it from their biological processes. And then the industry was like, oh, that's awkward. And people started calling it marine snot. And then they were like, we can, we can work with this. And then they called it marine snow, because that sounds more beautiful. But now what they're actually trying to do is they're like, this is a good idea. If we can get it to stay down there covered in a layer of slime, we win. Except that, next slide, there was a lot of layers of light down there. Right? So maybe it didn't hit your animals up top, but then it destroyed everything that they depend on below. And there's been a lot of things from the Gulf in terms of health issues and stuff because of dispersants. But a lot of the universities that are studying this are getting money from industry to do it. And so a lot of the research coming out is saying that it's fine. Next slide. Um, but that is just corrects it, which was used in the Gulf. And this is something with open ocean, they will use this. This is kind of like one of their major go-tos. Um, that's some of the health issues that is just on like the MSDS sheet, like the medical kind of sheet where you have to like be like, this is what this does. And a lot of people have been having some really interesting health impacts. And some of it is that the chemical itself combines with the oil, combines with salt water, and then does different things in the body. But you can read it there, it's nothing you want, right? And you see that with oil spill workers, whether it's oil or dispersants, they get really sick after. And there's something, I think Exxon Valdez workers, they weren't seeing people get past 50 years old, right? So, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Another thing they did, this is like, it looks really good with the media, but they did something called high pressure washing. This happened with the Exxon Valdez. They basically were trying to like wash oil off rocks with high pressure. And it looked good, it made it look like they were doing something, but that was what pushed all the oil into the sand, where then it kind of got stuck there and it became like a bit of like an asphalt mat. And there's certain places in Prince William Sound where you can dig down and still find oil because of that, and that was in the 80s. So that's not something you want either, necessarily. Um, I talked briefly about sorbents, those are those paper towels. The other things people do is it's just straight up manual cleanup. They have people raking, shoveling, taking oils off the beach. Now the picture at the bottom with the man in the blue shirt, that's in the Gulf. And one thing to kind of notice is there was people working in the Gulf who had no protective gear. It was also really hot, but they weren't wearing respirators. They weren't wearing kind of Tyvek suits and they were breathing that all in. And that's how people get sick. And that's again, from just oil spills and all that kind of stuff, those are some of the impacts that people deal with. And the companies will say that there's nothing wrong, but in their own kind of medical safety data sheets, it does say this causes cancer. It does say those information, but that never comes out. And one of the things is they don't always like their workers wearing respirators, which should be what you're doing in that environment because of the volatile organic compounds. They don't like them wearing respirators because then it makes things look toxic. And if they want people back on the beach, if they want tourists, if they want to say it's all okay, you walk around looking like it's Chernobyl isn't a good visual, right? And that's one of the things that actually guides it. Um, so when I say if people are doing any kind of remediation and you end up trying to handle this more as a bioremediator person, you need to be thinking about what gear you're going to wear. And I've seen, I was working a spill in Vancouver where all these sweet community people were like, we're going to run down and clean the rocks. Um, and they were like, no one was wearing any gear and they all felt sick the next day. And so if you're going to be that person trying to lead people into it, you need to be responsible for your people and make sure they suit up. And respirators got to be done properly. You can't just put it on your face, but it makes the work harder, but then it makes you live longer. And that's important. What? You need to know how to do it. Like you can't have a beard and wear a respirator. You're screwed. Yeah. Um, you gonna shave? You gonna do that? Can you go one slide up, babe? Okay, so 
I don't know what I'm doing with time, but let's see. Oh yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, so buyer mediation. So that that's just the conventional side, and you could go. We could go so much deeper into that, but I was like, we don't have time. Um, but you can ask me stuff after. The buyer mediation piece is often when industry and government have they've left. They either never came in the first place or they left, right? Because they're gonna go and they're gonna do their big things. Hopefully, you can get in and be like, do not do dispersants. Bring attention to like dispersants and institute burning and fight that because that'll just hurt your community in some ways. But when they've left, that's been a lot of communities that I know where they're like, what do we do now? Because they've said they've done the cleanup. We're still seeing oil. We're worried about our fish and our livelihood. Now what do we do? And that's a big part for us to kind of get engaged. There's also some parts where the oil is coming to shore where we can intercept it. So when I think about biomediation, I'm like, we got to skill up. We got to understand oil spills. We got to understand how to keep ourselves safe. We need to know the industry lingo and know how to kind of, kind of push back against it. When I was in Louisiana, I've been there for two years, I would go to all these oil spill conferences kind of like incognito and pretend like I didn't know what I was doing and be like, oh, I'm a student and learn so much because I'm like, I want to know what you guys are talking about because they, they know a lot of information, but it's not always what we want them to be doing. Um, we need to organize. We need to have groups of people who know how to actually respond to a spill, who have the mycelium, the mycology experience, who have the remediation experience. We need to have healers on our side who actually understand when people are getting sick, what that looks like and how to take care of them because that is a huge part of this. And then we need to be ready to respond, right? And that means having the actual materials ready. So if you want to do remediation, micro-remediation, but you have no mycelium or no bunker bags ready, you're losing valuable time, right? And so these are all things to think about in terms of gearing up for an actual response. In terms of what we're thinking about bioremediation, the best parts are like, how do you catch the oil? Because if you catch it, then you can remediate it, right? Like if oil is just on the beach, you can't walk up to the beach and throw mycelium on it. And I have such a sore point with this, I think I've mentioned this eight times, because in Vancouver, there was a spill and all these hippies went down to the beach and literally were throwing mycelium on the beach. And then also being like, namaste. And I was like, oh. And so <laughs> it was hard for me, it was hard. Because then the water would come in and just take it back out, right? And who knows if the oil, could, like the oyster mushrooms could handle the salt. It was just a mess and it was like hot, hot sun. And that's not what you needed. But had they been a bit smarter and kind of caught the oil with some kind of sorbent or boom that we can biologically break down, then they could take it away and actually do the remediation. Right? But they weren't thinking like that. They just were being like one love and nothing happened. <laughs> so, um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about, you have to intercept it, you gotta then collect it, and then you can do the actual like microbial, phyto, or myco breakdown. Next one. Um, <laughs> you like that? Um, so natural sorbents, this is the thing. So we talked about how the industry uses these like plasticky paper towels. You can't kind of, if you tried to break those down, it would take you a long time. But there are other things in nature that absorb lots of oil. Because you're just trying to sop it up with something that then we can use bacteria or mushrooms to break down. And so some examples of that is straw bales. Like you can actually make, like on the shore, you can make like actual straw bales so that the oil that's coming is kind of getting kind of pulled up by that. And then you got to remove it, take it somewhere, and start doing the breakdown, right? The picture in the middle was actually from... Um, a spill that our friend Mia Rose worked on, that was the Costco Busan spill. I don't know when that was, but that's your guys' area. And they used hair mats. So they made, because we, we all have lots of hair, um, and they made these hair mats because hair really absorbs oil, right? And it can pull up a lot of it. So they would take these hair mats, squeeze out as much oil as they could to recollect it, but then take the rest of it and then do what we call um, ex situ remediation, which is where you take it out of the environment and put it in these bins, really good aerated space and do the mycelial and the bacterial breakdown. And they found that that was helpful in a lot of ways, except that hair is kind of antifungal. So they were actually kind of fighting the fungi for a bit. Um, coconut coir is another one. And industry actually uses coconut coir on water. If they have a spill in the water, they'll actually throw the coconut coir on it and then recollect it to kind of sop up the oil. And then that can be used to do some kind of breakdown. I've heard people talk about making mats out of cattails because that fluff is incredibly absorbent. So just thinking like, what is a natural boom? How could we make a natural, well, you're trying to make a natural sorbent. Double points if you make a natural sorbent that's also a boom, you know what I'm saying? Next slide, which is this. So these people made these awkward looking hair sausages. That's the left hand corner. Um, and they just stuffed hair into these long socks. And it was some kind of burlap hair sausage situation. And again, those can be the oils coming to shore. It's hitting that, and then you're removing that, right? An even better option is these kind of burlap sacks with like myceliated straw in it already. So there's already this kind of mycelial action happening. Um, and I think Maya's gonna talk more about the micro-remediation piece. So I'm gonna pull back on that. But that's acting as both a boom 
and a sorbent, and there's some kind of remediation happening. And then in the left bottom, you have these straw wattles. And this is a picture from the fire, kind of some of the remediation that happened post-fire in Sonoma County. And you guys all heard about that, Santa Rosa. There's an amazing group of permaculture folks um, up there who did some incredible response, but it was more to the fire. So they were dealing with like a whole host of contaminants that come from things burning to the ground, not necessarily oil, but they were trying to keep it from going into the waterways and contaminate the streams. And so again, where you put this stuff is important, but you can take that straw water, you can either myceliate it when you put it in there, so that's all ready to go, or you can actually just take the straw and then myceliate it after, right? So I'm actually gonna be on time, I'm so excited. Okay, um, or maybe not. Um, microbial remediation, this is, there's different ways to do this, and there's a lot of really good work on bacteria and oil and breaking down hydrocarbons, and I think it's some of the best work. And I think industry has embraced it the most because it's, it's helpful in certain ways. Um, we have a friend and a colleague who actually breaks down oil, like he takes oil contaminated soil and then does thermophilic composting of that. And there's certain tricks and stuff he does. He does these long windrows. He has his own special kind of inoculum of bacteria that he's trained to actually be like petrophilic. So there's petrophilic species of bacteria and petrophilic means it likes to eat oil, literally. And so those species are in there and they will actually help break down the oil. And so he does these windrows of compost, gets it to a certain temperature to actually help like physically break it down and then is constantly spraying it with the bacterial inoculant. And he's had incredible luck with that. I'm sure you guys are gonna maybe mention more. Um, the problem with this though is, again, you can't do this anywhere where it's gonna run off. You gotta be watching the runoff from it because you actually are dealing with a toxic pile of earth. You need to be wearing a respirator when you're turning it or front load turning it, right? Like there's health issues because it's off gassing and you don't wanna put it right by a playground. Like, you know, just common sense. Um, the other picture is a picture of actively aerated compost tea. And that can be useful too, in terms of, again, you can actually buy some of the professional oil inoculant bacteria stuff, or you can make your own. Um, you have to have the right kind of aeration, you have to have the right ingredients in it. Making sure you put things like worm castings is critical. It's being like, you're done. Um, but I have one more slide. But like worm castings are critical because worms actually have in their gut a bacteria called Pseudomonas florensis that can break down oil. It is petrophilic. So that's kind of like if you're not in a big lab and you can't have your fancy bacteria, that's one way to do it. Um, and then again, it's like just putting a lot of that on the situation. Final slide, phytoremediation. Um, we heard John, there was a lovely man on our panel, the Australian man, who talked Tom, yesterday about Tom. floating islands. Tom. Okay. I was like, Tom, John, John, Tom. Um, I'm just going to call him Mike. So. They, he talked about um, basically floating islands. There's a lot of plants that can do really good work with kind of dealing with hydrocarbons. A lot of them are trees and grasses. And the interesting thing with that is it's actually a mixture of them pulling it out and kind of into their, their kind of biomass and evaporating it. With the, the grasses though, there's a lot of pieces around like a bacteria and plant kind of interaction. Because if you look at some of the things there, you're seeing nitrogen fixers. And so there's a neat thing going on in terms of how they're handling it, but they're good at remediating both PAHs or VOCs. Um, floating islands would be what you would do if it was like in a lake, potentially. And then again, you'd maybe try to intercept it with mushroom stuff. And then other things like, again, poplars and willows or if it's in a land environment. So I think that's it. Done. If you have any questions for me, because that was really fast and I actually have that presentation that goes a lot longer, or you want to talk to me about de-oiling wildlife, because that's my creepy passion, um, that's my email. And I do have a book that has all of that in it. So that's it. Uh, who here identifies as a mushroom person? Nice. Who's here to like talk about mushroom stuff? No? Okay. Um, so I'm going to give a really brief rundown of uh, fungal biology and how microremediation works. Um, a really, really short uh, synopsis of it. And um, then I'm going to talk about why that works for remediating oil particularly. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about how we can work with fungi for dealing, addressing with other uh, kinds of pollutants. Um, and then we're going to get a little bit more into the environmental justice piece as well. So if you want to go. Oh, where's my picture? Maybe try pressing it again. Aha. Uh -huh. um, so uh, who knows the word mycelia? Would anybody like to define that for people who might not know the word? 
it's written on the board. It's really easy. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Awesome. I'm going to have you guys talk so I don't have to talk as much. Yeah, it's the body. So um, fungi are not plants, right? But if we were to use a plant metaphor, we can think of uh, the mycelium as like the roots, the branches, the trunk, and a mushroom itself is just the fruit, right? It's like the apple on the tree. It's just the sexual reproductive part. It's not the, it's not the actual organism, but it is made out of mycelium as well. Um, and when we're working with uh, fungi, we're not really working with the mushrooms so much as the mycelium to do the actual work. Um, substrate is a word I'm probably going to throw around, and that's the thing that they're, it's their habitat slash food source, uh, because it's one and the same. Uh, and then I'm also, uh, might throw around the word spawn, which is like uh, more food, um, or it can be something that um, mushrooms can be growing, grown on that you add to it. Um, and you think of spawn as like, mycelium with intention is, is a nice way to put it. Um, so yeah, this one there's going to be, if you want to keep, woo, there we go. So um, I hope everybody ate some food today. Yeah? So what's happening right now um, in your tum tum is there are these enzymes that are being released and breaking down that food and turning it into different smaller molecules that we can then uh, use to grow and live and do all of our biological functions. Um, and mycelium does the exact same thing, but in their environment, in their substrate. So they're releasing those enzymes and breaking down whatever it is. Wood, it's usually cellulose and lignin, uh, basically different forms of carbon, right? Which is the same things, all the food that we eat is carbon-based as well. Um, and if you're not eating, if you're eating something that's not carbon-based, I'd be worried about you, unless it's water. Um, and as it's breaking it down into smaller pieces, it then, we're going to press it again, is putting out um, all these different um, elements and create, can create all of these different things. Um, so if you all took chemistry class, um, you might recognize that molecular structure up there. That's a hydrocarbon called cellulose, um, which is an important part of uh, any plant. Um, and if you want to go forward one more, uh, fungi. Um, are really good at breaking apart these, which are called hydrocarbon bonds. So this is the chemical structure of, um, of petroleum, uh, which is very similar to the one that we just saw that's in cellulose. And um, if you think about petroleum, what is petroleum? What is, it, what is it actually? What is it made out of? Plants. Plants. What's that? Fossilized substance, right? It's plants that died millions of years ago, and instead of breaking down, and one theory on this is that there weren't the uh, species of fungi, there wasn't the type of fungal diversity on planet Earth at the time when these plants were growing to break it down. So the plants matter just kind of piled on top and piled on top and piled on top, and it kind of just sat down there and turned into liquid eventually. Um, so it's, it's like it fermented. It's fermented plant matter that's really, really old. Um, and Fungi, as we just learned, are really good at breaking down plants, um, and particularly those hydrocarbon bonds. So um, you guys are probably aware of this, but pretty much everything, almost everything around us involves uh, petroleum in some form, right? The clothes we're wearing, a plastic pen you might be writing with, um, the sheen on this, um, it's everywhere and everything. Um, and it's also used for a lot of really uh, toxic things like petrochemicals and agriculture, uh, gasoline, herbicides, um, all of these different elements that are used, um, even, you know, especially all the biological weapons, things like this. Um, petroleum's in, in pretty much everything. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go a little bit back to that in a minute, but I also wanted to mention uh, microfiltration is a, um, a, a slightly different process where we're using it as a biological filter. And this can be used, um, like Lila was talking about, to uh, deal with water that's contaminated with oil, but it's uh, more commonly used to deal with E. coli um, and other um, uh, viruses that um, can be toxic to people that might go into a waterway. Let's say there's a lot of cows um, cows tend to poop out a lot of E. coli, which can then get into a waterway. And um, there's a lot of really cool ways that you can work with fungi to hold on to that, um, to catch, basically capture that, uh, those, all of the effluent that's going into the water, and then break it down in situ in, in the place where it is. 
Um, this is a project that happened in the East Bay, um, where you know that's a seasonal stream, water's running through it. These uh, bunker bags that are inoculated with uh, the Cerferia rugoso annulata are placed down there, staked down, and um, that mycelial web, remember that picture at the beginning where you, where you see that web, is a really amazing filter for catching that stuff. Um, and we also talked about how it puts out antibiotics, right? Um, and, and the antibiotics that we take are actually made from penicillin, which is a fungus. Um, so that antibiotic then kills that, um, those viruses and protozoa and bacteria. Yeah. Um, so these mycelial webs, here's a nicer picture of it are all around us. And um, so thinking about the drought that we're in here in California, that really has impacted our mycelial webs um, because fungi require a lot of water to, in order to live. And then uh, what happens when the mycelium dries up and then you have a big rainstorm? What happens? What have we had? A, what, remember those big rains that we had like a year and a half ago? Yeah, flooding runoff erosion like massive erosion do you guys who lives in the bay area all right do y'all remember when like all of the roads were closed like everywhere <laughs> you like couldn't get anywhere because the erosion was so intense trees were falling down everywhere there were huge mudslides um you know i live in santa cruz highway 17 was closed for a really long time with these massive mudslides um it was really intense and a lot of that has to do with those mycelial webs being weakened by the drought um, and then, of course, the plants also being weakened. Um, but plants actually do very little for, they do a lot. We can, we can give them a lot of credit for holding onto soil, but it's actually the mycelium that does the majority of that work. Um, yeah, you want to keep going? So do you want to talk about the mycobooms in, um, in Santa Rosa, around Santa Rosa? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you kind of already did. But here's a, here's a cool picture. <laughs> so this is a, a project that people did um, after the, the big fires that happened in Sonoma County. Um, as the houses burned down, of course, houses are made out of a lot of toxic material. Um, and then when the rains come, that's all going to go uh, into the waterways, um, and water that people drink out of, water where there's salmon. Um, and there's been you know, a huge effort in Sonoma County to restore the salmon. Um, and so this was a, a big concern, and um, there was a really huge effort to create these mycobooms as a protective barrier. Um, I, I would just like to see, like, again, it's the straw bottle, and then you have mycelium. That's a bag of mycelium. And you have to do it right. You can't just throw it in there, put it there, and think it's going to do it right away. It actually has to completely take over to a certain degree so that it's the filter. Like, the filter doesn't start to all be put together. It takes how many months? Uh, it takes, oh, it depends, but like okay. if. Yeah, a few weeks. Yeah. yeah. So it needs to actually be the filter. That's why you need to have that preparedness. You need to have people who have this already ready. And again, putting it on shore or preventatively in your stream. If you're already working with a pipeline situation, like why not have this near the pipeline? Or actually skip that right. and make micro swales around the pipeline. Because yeah. The oil does fill, it actually is already going somewhere that can handle it. So right. A lot of well, but you also want to. No, so it's like difficult. You like yeah, you can um, you can hold on to cultures um, of the mushrooms for a long time, and those are easy to keep. Oh, I should stay behind the microphone, huh? He's like making a look. What's that? Yeah, so there is a salt tolerant, a more salt tolerant strain of oyster mushroom, and oysters are kind of the famous mushroom because they're so effective at uh, breaking down oil. Um, and uh, I believe Fungi Perfecti has that strain, and you can try to order it from them. Um, and, but there, it also makes sense to you know bring it on shore, uh, like Lila was saying. You want to bring stuff on shore uh, when you're when you're working with that. Um, also, Okay, great. I was going to mention it. Um, but yeah. I'm really confused about the supply chain of doing this kind of situation. I mean, you're talking about you have to have it near uh, where you might have an oil spill. Well, the, the people that are interested in extracting the oil out of the ground, they're not really very focused on environmental factors. Right. And so. Uh, you know, it seems kind of strange to me that 
we were talking about in San Francisco and maybe doing it in Santa Rosa or Arcata, I don't know where it's being done, but you know, I just, this is a living approach to uh, that guiding us. So this has to be kind of like ongoing, if you're going to do extraction, you have to do this in an ongoing way. Right. So where, where is the team to make this happen where the oil is being extracted? Because There's, it's yeah. not good enough right. for a few people in Santa Rosa to be smart enough and have the resources to do this. Yeah, it's absolutely. Not, it's not that resource intensive. It takes some time. And it's also this is stuff that can be moved. It's it's not so, you know, like you could yeah. be in San Francisco or Santa Rosa and be having the supplies and having it ready, and you could drive it somewhere. But when you're going to answer the question, but I think we have four questions till the end because we want to make sure we don't run out of time. Yeah. So. But I would like to address this. Um, I mean, fossil fuel extraction is inherently unsustainable. There's no way that it can be done without causing a lot of uh, impacts to human health and to wildlife and to our planet. Um, just the extraction process itself, you know, a lot of times we're getting our oil from other countries, um, except now with fracking, but that process in itself is incredibly damaging and incredibly harmful and then moving it around. So, you know, when it spills, that's usually when people start thinking they're like oh no something went wrong you know but it's actually the entire process is going to cause a lot of damage no matter what you do and then of course the climate impacts are, are massive so while you know yes these corporations should be uh, doing better job and have this kind of uh, material ready um, it's often left up to communities to, to pick up the slack. The people who are actually impacted are, are you know, 95, 97% of the, the time are going to be the ones that really have to deal with it and work with it. So that's just the reality of, of the world that we live in. That said, there are a lot of mushroom farms, particularly in the Bay Area, we're very fortunate with that. And a lot of them are very sympathetic to doing this type, the, to the efforts that we're, we're interested in. Um, Far West Fungi down in Moss Landing has helped and donated spawns uh, to different microremediation efforts. Um, and so there are things like that. Um, and in terms of, of uh, holding on to it and scaling up, um, I mean, if we have people who are ready and we build these networks, which I'd love to build with you all today, and, and, and we do have different organizations around. We have Barrier Applied Mycology, there's the Counterculture Labs, um, and then there's a few of us down in Santa Cruz who are, we're, we've been talking about this kind of stuff, and I'd love to include more people in that conversation of how we can be more prepared. Um, but moving on, where, did we talk about microfilters? Yeah. Did we skip a slide? Mm -hmm. What was the, can you go back? Oh yeah, so there's a lot of potential, um, I don't really need to talk about this, but there's, a, just, there's just a lot of potential for microfiltration in California. Um, and just something to keep in mind that I wanna make sure is clear is that like, it's not just a matter of like inoculating the straw and then hoping that it's all happy and good. It's a, you have to keep it alive and you have to prepare that straw. And it actually, you know, there's a lot of work involved in, in creating not a whole lot of work. It's not as intensive as conventional uh, remediation, but there, there is a lot of maintenance. And it's really, and this is um, Mia Maltz, who we had all hoped would uh, be at this presentation today. There's a little bit of a confusion around the organizing of this event. Um, but what she is always, always saying is like, we need the baseline data. So if you're going in and you're doing a remediation project, take baseline soil samples, collect those soil samples, or collect the water samples before you do it so that we can prove that this is, these methods are effective or disprove that they're effective. We know we're just wasting our time, you know? So to collect that data. Can we save questions for the end? Is that all right? Cool. Let's keep going. Um, so I just wanted, uh, back to the fungal biolo biology piece, I wanted to um, distinguish between uh, two of the different types of fungi, basically two of their different ecological roles. We have sapotrophic fungi, which are the decomposer fungi, and those are the ones that we're working with primarily for doing microremediation and dealing with, um, oh, I'm already out of time, um, and dealing with uh, different chemicals. And then we have mycorrhizal fungi, which build a symbiotic relationship with plants and basically expand the root system of the plant. Um, they connect to the roots and then expand it and give the plant more access to water and minerals. And in exchange, they get glucose from the, from the plant. Um, and these, if you can go back. That's all right. Um, and there's one type of mycorrhizal fungi called our muscular mycorrhizal fungi that um, are really good at holding onto soil 
um, and can be uh, used as, uh, in the process of bioremediation. So if you think about um, a tree falling in the forest, right? Um, it's, these aren't going to be the first ones that are just going to come on and grow in on that log that just fell. Right? Those are going to be the saprotrophic fungi, the early decomposers. Decomposition is a whole complex process. Um, and very late in that process, and more common in, in prairies and in farms, um, you're going to have more of these fungi that are growing on the root systems of different plants. Um, and the dust bowl, uh, if you think about prairies, people are like, oh, it's just empty land, right? And you just see that there's some grass on the surface. But actually, underneath, there's this whole deep world, these roots that go way down deep into the earth. And that's actually where all the carbon is being stored. That's where, where all the action's happening. So when they, they tilled the soil and they cut down all these prairies, we had the dust bowl. Um, and Lila was going to mention something about, no, nope? okay. So I feel like this is important and I know I'm over time, but I, I think that this is important to talk about how this work is actually a part of a, um, a climate justice process. It's not, um, you know, we were talking about like how corporations should be responsible. A lot of Corporations have, uh, even, even oil companies have approached Core Renewal wanting to work with us and then patent our methods um, because they want to be able to justify and keep doing the extraction. Um, when in fact, like our, the angle we need to take with this is not one that enables them, but one that um, is connected to larger efforts for environmental justice. And Lexi's going to talk a bit about how that can happen. Um, and I also think it's important to, if you want to go to the next one, be thinking about how we can work with fungi as a part of our social movements. Um, and, you know, decentralized networks, sharing resources and information and getting it where it needs to be going, um, and focusing on relationships rather than um, building biomass. So that's what they do. Is they, they're all about building relationships and connecting. And I think in a lot of our movements, we're all about like, how many people can we get at this rally? How, you know, all of these uh, big above the surface. And actually, like, if we put our energy into building relationships and connecting and working together and distributing resources, um, it can be a lot more effective. Um, yeah. There's a, uh, yeah. I'll just end there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Maya and Lila, for that introduction. And um, it's a little bit of the background and what got me interested in, um, in going to Ecuador in the first place, learning about the history of sucumbios. Um, I don't know if y'all were in the presentation yesterday, but I'm going to elaborate a little bit more about um, Ecuador and the history in the, in the sucumbios region of the Ecuadorian Amazon. And in this photo, you can see a reason, two really bipolar reasons and, um, and why people come to visit Ecuador, why tourists come to our region. And it's either to come to a really um, hot spot, biodiverse region where um, it's the highest biodiversity per acre uh, in the world, or they come for a toxic tour where they come to see the petroleum contamination um, that's been left over from historical resource extraction. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so between the years of 19, in the 1960s to the 1990s, Texaco, formerly known as Chevron, um, opened up the pristine Amazon forest, northeastern Amazon forest, and um, 10 years prior had discovered the technology to re-inject the formation water used to, in drilling, um, which is lots of chemicals and, and salts to penetrate the soil, um, kilometers into the soil and um, in order to pull out the petroleum. And so that formation water, um, when, when it needs to be disposed, is also really high in, in crude oil. And so they had discovered the ability to re-inject that deep into the ground, but when they're in Ecuador, um, for them to, uh, they realized that they saved a lot of money by just uh, throwing it into the jungle, creating pits instead of re-injecting it. And so throughout the region of Sucumbios and Orellana provinces, there's over a thousand unlined pits that um, filled of formation water and crude petroleum um, that have been there for over 50 years. 
And every time it rains in the rainforest, which is daily, those pits rise with water and it, um, they seep out into the streams. Down, streams run into the rivers. Rivers, um, there's over 14 indigenous nationalities that live on these rivers and on top of all the wildlife, flows through, um, through Ecuador, through Peru, through the Brazil, and out into the ocean. Um, so in this region, there's over 18 and a half billion gallons of oils estimated. And um, because of that, um, go to the next one. Yeah, because of that, um, over 30,000 people organized as the Union of the Affected People Against Texaco, UDAPT, um, formed a class action legal lawsuit against Texaco. That's been going on for 27 years. Um, the Ecuadorian um, court um, pushed in favor of, of the Ecuadorian people to, um, to charge Texaco for nine and a half billion dollars um, to for reparation purposes, and which 27 years later Texaco Chevron currently Chevron um, has not paid one cent and has used every possibility as a corporation to escape those charges, and um, and just yet just the day before yesterday it seemed like there was a bit, pretty big decision from um, a European court that was in favor of Chevron not having to pay. So because of all of this and because of this fight and this ongoing generational problems um, impacting their culture, their land, their food, their water, um, their health, this region has the highest cancer rates um, in Ecuador and certainly in South America and high up there in the world. Lots of birth defects, skin, def skin defects. And um, because of all of this, those 30,000 people, um, currently known as UDAPT, are working to create the first environmental and, rep and social reparations committees to, um, to confront the damage that's been done to their land and to their cultures and to their life. And so there's been, there's been other committees towards studying cancer and providing people access to hospitals um, and to providing rainwater catchment systems throughout the region. And so now they've invited co-renewal, and this past April we formed a, an official collaboration alliance to develop programs combining ancestral and scientific knowledge to bring um, remedi land remediation programs um, in, in collaboration with the, with the indigenous and colonial farmers of the region. Um, so as we know, it's a very complex issue. Um, there's different points, point sources of contamination. Um, we also have what's called mecheros, uh, where they like, where all the natural gas, instead of collecting it, um, they just burn it. So there's everywhere there's an oil drill, which is over 790. There's, a, there's flares that are constantly burning and they have been for 50 years. So there's a big fight to get those, um, to work that out. <laughs> um, so you also have air contamination. You have the water tables, contaminated wells, um, and also soil. There's um, a lot of these pits were remediated by Texaco, which really meant they were just topped off with dirt. And with the rain, that petroleum also surfaces. A lot of cultivators, um, everybody lived, a lot of cultivators uh, live and grow on contaminated land and see huge problems with their crops, huge problems in their well water. And, um, and so the issue is complex. Uh, there's no one simple solution to remediation. There's no one simple um, solution to to heal it all, um, and especially it's very socially traumatic, the generational um, pain that's gone on in the region. Um, so we talked about these reparation committees that are, um, so each one of these committees, let's talk about the environmental reparation committee that's starting. Um, it's, in a, uh, there's 40, there's 40 different communities of the 130 that are involved with UDAPT um, that already have different 
in um, re reparation committees, whether it's for cancer or water or other things. And so those 40 communities, um, in each one of those, somebody voluntarily chooses that I want to take charge in this, I want to be trained in this, I want to give back to my community and, and, and implement this in our life and in our community. And so there's 40 volunteers from 40 different communities that want to participate in the Environmental Reparations Committee. Um, and they understand that um, any type of remediation and reparations is going to involve them. They want to be a part of it. They want to do it. They want to be trained in this. And they want to choose what they want to be trained in. So, so our proposal in collaboration with UDAPT, um, after hearing their desires and um, how they kind of imagined what this could be like, um, is to organize the first Environmental Reparations Committee assembly, where over 100 community leaders, on top of the 40 new, the first pioneering Environmental Re Reparations Committee leaders, to all collaborate in a, um, and start off with the first assembly that focus on, focuses on um, understanding what the contamination is, what are the point sources of contamination, where is it coming from, understanding what those impacts are on the environment and on our, on our health. Um, and, and so it's important when we think about reparations, remediation, understanding what, um, you know, what it is that we're dealing with, how it's being, in, um, how it impacts our environment in order to think about the correct approach as far as remediation goes. And so, and so we, want to, we want to really discuss that with them, understand it from them, but also have experts that can really um, explain this information in a, in a, translate it into a way that can be understood. So it's also really important that they understand basic ecology and basic soil regeneration. Um, and also talking about the pros and cons of conventional remediation and bioremediation um, on an economic level, on the client, and on the, um, in the social and an environmental and climatic level, in sucumbios, on a financial level, um, so that we can properly make applicable decisions that work on a community scale. And also really understanding what are the issues, what are different problems that we can do on a community scale and personal scale, and also where do we need a professional to come in and to, to oversee and, and guide us through these processes. Um, so the, right now the only thing holding us back is, uh, is financing this project. Um, the committee is ready, we're ready, we have collaborations um, through, through amazing connections. Everybody, um, there's a lot of people with different niches that are wanting to collaborate and transfer this knowledge from laboratories, from um, small scales, into a reality, into an applicable situation. And we have this community and this network of people that are eager, that are wanting to train, that are wanting to create programs, intergenerational programs to uh, responsibly inspire their youth um, in, in ecological restoration programs. So, um, one of the things that we think that's really important to consider is what is applicable in this region. And so one of the things, we were talking about Bob Rawson, who's a friend, um, who's a colleague, and he's a bacteriologist and has over 35 years of experience in bacterial, bacterial remediation of petroleum-contaminated soils all over the world, um, from Mexico to Canada to the U.S. and Egypt and tropical regions. And so through his experience and um, you know he's also loves fungi and mycology but through his, his experience thus far bacteria are voracious carbon eaters and it's very uh, it's basic soil regeneration compost and um, 
And so, so something like um, bioremediation is our methods that favor labor over capital. So it's a method, um, so we're saying that instead of bringing in private companies to use all of this funding to go into a project, this funding goes into chemicals and machinery and to a private company to come in and leave, and that money ends up going to the World Bank pretty quickly. Um, or we can, through bioremediation, we can use um, a local workforce that also gets um, is educated in environmental responsibility and regeneration practices um, and also that funding stays locally it goes into the pockets of the locals and their techniques and methods and tools that can stay in the community um, not only are you coming in with restoration but you're also considering the people and the nature and the habitants that are already there which is contrary to most conventional remediation practices. So that's what that graph explains, is favoring um, labor over capital. Yeah. Right, so Lila was talking about compost tea, which is just, a, it's like a jacuzzi for bacteria, and it's a way to augment bacteria into the, bil into the billions. And this is something that anybody can do anywhere in the world. Lila was talking about using um, uh, worm poop, worm castings, and um, for, for the bacteria in their, in their guts. Also, a really well-made aerated compost um, also has very beneficial bacteria. And so what we can do is take some of that soil and we can put it into this hot tub, really um, nutritious hot tub, and aerate it. Okay, no heat, so just more like a cold, a cold tub. A high rate, yeah, a cold jacuzzi, and um, and that's what is called a compost tea. So windrow composting. Oh, okay, I don't have a picture of windrow composting, but it's giant um, um, mounds of contaminated soil, or it can be normal soil and just normal composting, um, windrow composting. But in the remediation, we take the the contaminated soil. And we do lasagna layers with, uh, with, with manures, with different, um, different agricultural waste products, sawdust, um, depending on what you have in your region, and you do a giant layer of it. The mass of it is really important. The details of that are really important. Bacterial remediation works when we meet all of the conditions that the bacteria need to live. They need water, they need air, they need temperature. A lot of bacterial remediation projects do not work because they're not aerating it or it doesn't have proper moisture content. So that's what we see with the local remedia um, remediation companies in Lago Agrio or in, in Sucumbios where we live is that they're not aerating their piles. Bob went to their remediation lands and they said oh, this bacterial remediation isn't working. And he asked them how often they were aerating their piles and they said two to three times a month when it should be two to three times a week. So it's an art, it's a science, and these are things that we can um, do from the ground up, from the community up, um, learning basic ecology, basic soil regeneration, composting. And so this is an example of, um, of Bob's work in Mexico where they degraded 98% reduction in, in hydrocarbons in 42 days. Um, yeah. Right, so this reparations program, um, the, gen the, the various reparation programs are working on many different projects from social to environmental um, endeavors and specifically with this environmental reparations programs, we also need a wide variety of approaches and things to consider and researches alongside with the indigenous, providing them the tools and knowledge. Um, I'm sorry, not providing them, but collaborating with them because there's a lot of knowledge there about what's growing there. In these 50-year-old pits, we see um, 
lots of flora and fauna, fauna not fauna, just lots of uh, flora growing out of, of the pits, 50-year-old pits directly. I've seen um, fungi growing directly out of the petroleum and ferns and different types of, um, and we know that bacteria is thriving there too. So when we make a compost tea, um, one of the things to experiment is augmenting that the bacteria that are native and living on that, that have adapted to thriving in the, in the petroleum. And so there's lots of studies to be made there whether these organisms are petrotolerant and just tolerating living there or whether they're petrophilic and actually breaking down the petroleum. So under these conditions, um, we can augment the we can augment the systems, ecosystems, and climate conditions for these organisms to thrive and to be able to provide them oxygen and temperature and food um, so that they can do their work as nutrient recyclers in the ecosystem. Great. So my, um, my family's project is called Amisachu. Amisachu is um, the Kofans were the original um, nation living there before Texaco came in and called the city Lago Agrio, um, which means Sour Lake after Sour Lake, Texas, their first oil drill in Texas. And so Amisachu is the name that the Kofans had for this region before um, Texaco arrived. It means forest of, of bamboo. And, um, and so my, my in-laws 12 years ago bought a cattle ranch that was all um, that was just grass, it was deforested, and they started reforesting it with native wood trees that are going in extinct, um, and lots of fruit trees, and, um, and now it's just this edible forest in the middle of a petroleum extraction region, um, deforestation for monoculture, palm oils, cattle, and so this is a picture of, um, of my jungle laboratory where we study mushroom cultivation um, and reforestation practices and remediation practices. And um, under the Sucumbios climate and um, economic conditions for replicability in, in this region. Yep. Um, so you can see this is the city, the encroaching city of Lago Agrio, an oil boom town growing, it's an airport, and right here, right here is oil drill number 26. That's my mailbox, that's my entrance. Um, oh. And so this is our, these dots are our house, and the last little one is in my laboratory. And we have around 10 hectares um, of reforested jungle. which um, lots of, of flora and fauna have returned there. There's over five species of monkeys um, and, and river otters. And that are, there's a stream, a contaminated stream that runs through our property that's downstream of the uh, State Oil Petrol Company, um, just a couple blocks downstream from them. And um, we actually had a, a couple years ago, we had three dogs and a bunch of chickens die in the same month, and we think there was from drinking the water in it. So I've been thinking a lot about how to filter this water, um, but it's, it's a complicated issue because some days it's, it's like uh, just a stream, and then after a big rain, it, it just floods the whole area. So I haven't quite figured it out, and I'm looking to collaborate on ideas and how to, how to figure out those biofiltration systems. Um, and so this is our laboratory, and as there's different methods studying local agricultural waste products, local resources, um, really dirty, economic, low technology methods to grow fungi in, a, in big quantities. Yeah. Um, so as I was saying, a lot of I've seen fungi growing directly out of these 50-year-old petroleum pits. Um, and so we can grow these out, and there's, um, it seems like there's a lot of potential to train fungi to be more petrotolerant or petrophilic. So we can, we can clone them and we can expand them and expose them to different portions, different percentages of contamination and slowly 
introduce them to the contaminant. And they have like different keys, different tools, where they just have to pick them out different in their DNA to figure out what's the tool to break that petroleum down. Um, because as we know, petroleum is old trees and dinosaurs. What's the role of fungi? They decompose organic matter. And so they don't see a big difference between the petroleum and the woody substrate. Um, a lot of those species that we see growing out of the petroleum are also being studied not only for breaking down petroleum and other PAHs and industrial compounds, but also for cancer treatments um, and supporting chemotherapy treatments and inhibiting tumor growths. So in a region where there's high petroleum contamination and high cancer rates, and I see these species growing out of the petroleum, it's like, it's a really magical message that I'm trying to learn <laughs> and learn how to grow them and work with them. Um, and maybe there's more applications that we don't quite know yet. Um, and so uh, currently we're the only mushroom cultivators in the Amazon, in the Ecuadorian Amazon, and we're working to change that and um, offer economic courses to um, to grow mushrooms for, for food and for medicine and also little by little um, remediation programs as we learn responsible techniques. But in order to have remediation on a bigger scale, we need sources of mycelium. And, um, and so little by little, we're, this is what we're working on. Um, yeah, so our family project is called Amisachu. And that's our email. Um, so if you have any questions or interest, or perhaps even have financial connections on how to push these projects forward, um, I'd be so excited to collaborate and listen. And I thank you for your time today. I didn't even look at the time. Oh, you did I still have five minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we are late. We, okay, so we started Sit late, <laughs> but there's hopefully you guys can stay for 15 more minutes. We want to leave time for questions because now we have time for questions. So, yes. Yeah. Do you have something you want to say about that? Yeah. Um, so there's a there's a certain process on on how to when we talk about bioremediation and succession. So there's different things that we can do. Bacteria don't break down heavy metals. Actually, nobody breaks down heavy metals. Mm -hmm. um, but some players, like fungi and plants, can bioaccumulate it into their bodies. And then we can remove it from the soil. Um, so for something like the bacterial remediation, um, many times we're diluting the soil with so much other carbon and, and sawdust and human manure, human manure, just manure, or human manure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to a point where those heavy metals are no longer concentrated. So depending on what your source, what your application of the soil is afterwards, uh, you need to test it and determine, do we need to now enter in with phytoremediation to accumulate heavy metals and take it out of the soil? Do we need to enter in with microremediation where the fungi can also accumulate heavy metals into their fruiting body? Um, but then it needs to also be respons uh, responsibly treated so that if that mushroom dies, the heavy metal goes right back into the soil. So they need to be properly removed so that animals aren't eating them either. And, and, then, and then how you appropriately dispose of them is a very uh, important yeah. conversation. And, and there's different methods that people are doing. Whether um, I always thought it was interesting to just like put it in concrete. Or like put it under sidewalks or something um <laughs> there's yeah there's a lot of different like with like i mean there's again there's a whole list like i have it in my book it's also online in different places but there's a whole list of certain plants that have been studied for heavy metal accumulation and same with mushrooms that isn't a definitive list there's probably plants that could do it but that just haven't been studied yet but it is really important to check it out because there's also a lot of people saying oh spinach will do it or this will do it and it's not necessarily been studied like there's a lot of like just like word of mouth. But the thing is, is like once you do it, you have to try to find the plant that does it the most effectively. You have to manipulate the soil for it to actually move enough. Like certain things like lead, if the pH is 
um, too basic, it is kind of immobilized. So it'll actually, it'll, it'll, it won't come up as easy as if the soil is more acidic. So there's like, you just kind of have to like, you know, there's some tinkering you have to do, but whether you're using mushrooms or plants, it's like there is a way to do it. The protocol for disposal is like, usually people dispose of it in a landfill. And again, it's like less volume, right? Than if you were to take all that soil and dispose it, but that's still moving the problem around. And then there's other things like incineration or immobilization, like what mm -hmm. Lexi's talking about. But again, even if you immobilize it, like you put it in concrete or you like, some people were talking about taking the heavy metal contaminated plant waste or mushroom waste and then running it through worm digesters because that makes it even more compact. And then there's also this interesting kind of like a mobilization that's happening there and then feeding that to trees. And then kind of it's getting stuck in like the body of the tree. And as long as you're not making like baby rattles out of it or forks, you might be all right. But it's like nothing is a good response with that. You know what I mean? Well, what people will do sometimes is like put all of the yep. plants that are hyper-accumulating in one compost pile that isn't going to leach into the water, um, like that has all these lines. You know? It has good signage. It has good signage. Yeah. You're not eating them, you know, and also if, like if you're growing mushrooms on the oil spill, you need to be really clear. Like the signage for the, um, if you guys saw for the um, micro restoration that happened in Santa Rosa, that you know, like don't eat these mushrooms because they're high in heavy metals. Mm -hmm. And then with coal dust, there's been some actual studies done on that. So I don't think any of us have worked on that. <laughs> Um, but there is some study. So it's interesting if you Google kind of like phytoremediation or cold or like bioremediation or you can find some stuff. So we can talk about that after if you want. It was you and then you and then you. Um, so you mentioned Houston after Harvey and I've, I've like lived in Houston um, a bunch over the last few years and I've done like food forest projects and urban gardening and stuff. And I'm kind of wondering like after Harvey, should I just be like, Telling people like don't even don't even grow anything, it's all fucked. No. Or mm -mm. should I no. just be like learning more about which plants are uptaking which toxins into which mm -hmm. tissues? Like I've heard some like, you know, the heavy metals won't end up in a fruit but it'll be in the leaves or things mm -hmm. like that. Like That's called fate of transport. So it's like, yeah, some parts of the plant will accumulate it in different ways. Like I think we like I think I read about PCBs, like they end up in the tendril of pumpkins, but not necessarily in the fruit. Or like lead will stay closer to the root of some flowers, but cadmium ends up in the seeds. Like there's some interesting mm -hmm. research on that. But I think in the situation of Harvey, there were places, there was communities that were right adjacent and near, you know, big oil refineries. And so when the floodwaters happened and there was also spills at the same time from those refineries for a whole host of reasons, you know, some of it being corporate negligence and everything, those communities got that kind of moved around. So it, it kind of depends on how widespread the flooding was. Was your neighborhood near that kind of stuff? Um, Katrina, post-Hurricane Katrina, there was a big concern around contaminants that had spread and there was phytoremediation that was done in certain places. It wasn't always done effectively, but I don't think you need, you need to kind of look at where the floodwaters went before you make that call. And, and test the soil. Yeah. And if we were going to get a test of work. what are we looking for in particular? Like, yeah. what would we look for in particular? Because you know you have to, it's yeah. kind of expensive. But that's a really good well, point. So yeah, so looking at what's already growing there, what kinds of weeds are growing there, are they, they might already actually be doing the remediation work that might have already be, been, been happening. Um, I would say that anybody who's growing, um, no matter whether there's been a major disaster or not, if you're growing in an urban area, Test the soil, um, yeah. and you know, like I, I'm always that, you know, like me is like I was like get that baseline data. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, know what you're working with and know what you're dealing with, and um, doing a bioremediation project um, might be a really good idea to do before you do, you know, grow a food forest or something. But it is like, yeah, if you can't afford to test your soil, that would just that would answer your questions real fast. Because you might have had that contamination, you might not have, um, and you want to look for heavy metals. Mm -hmm. and um, you know, VOCs and PAHs. Like that's what you want to be looking for. And if you just ask for a soil test, I made the mistake of asking for a soil test once because we were doing this really awesome um, herbal medicine garden. And I just said, hey, I want to get my soil test. And they said, great. And then I got the results back and it was like, oh, you have nitrogen and phosphorus. And I was like, oh, no contamination because it doesn't say it on the thing. It's because I didn't ask for it. You have to ask for what you want tested. Otherwise, you're going to end up not knowing. Like a UMass Yeah. Awesome.
all of our ducks in a row for this bacterial remediation pilot project that she was talking about and working with the Environmental and Social Reparations Committee um, to really get some, some justice in, in these collaborations. And the one thing that we've been waiting on for a, a really long time is the funding. Uh, so if anybody has a connection with the foundation or knows a major donor or has um, any anything you can do towards this, or if you even just have like $10, um, it can go a really long way. And this is our website, uh, corenewal.org or amazonmicorenewal.org. We'll get you to our website. Um, and then uh, if you do slash donate, you get to our, oh, our website page. <laughs> and we take PayPal, and we're also a nonprofit uh, organization. So any donations that you make are tax deductible. And a little goes a long way, I think, with this project. A long way. Like they're doing we're, amazing things with so little resources. So there's two more questions. Um, your, your second, your first, just okay. in terms of order of people. Just to reiterate, nonprofits are the best use of money you could possibly. We're the third economy and we're growing. Yeah. And we are like the best use of your money. If you want us to bang for your buck, this is where you put your money. Okay, so it's not a nonprofit. Really? Awesome. It's hard to sell. But I love what you're doing. And you know, I can see um, we need training for citizens involved, citizen expertise, like you have, we have hundreds of years to work on this project, you know, that, that all the rest of you know, and these companies go out of business, uh, in Santa Barbara, we have a, a thousand acres back in New Guiana, the whole company went bankrupt, it left its oil workers, mm -hmm. this was 1986, left its oil workers there, they didn't even know, and these were hill -tops. the other people from the hill country, they suddenly had to go out public assistance, nothing they ever do, because they had no paychecks. So they just abandoned everything, left it, and went bankrupt. Yeah. And so we're going to face this. We have a uh, kind of a capitalist economy that allows that to happen. So we have to take control of this. You know, we have to build the knowledge because we have hundreds of years of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and be real survival. So all of us need to be trained and generational because this is stuff that's going to stay with us even even if we stop using oil. We're not. I think the interesting thing, the interesting thing about that is that you can train yourself and it's not massive. Yeah. Like Lexi literally went to a mushroom course five years ago and is rocking this project out. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, everyone's different. Some people are natural mushroom people and really like to learn about microcultivation. And if that's not you, make sure you have a friend like that. And then other people are really good with growing plants. And then you have that person who like really likes to geek out on soil science and the person who's good at getting the money. Like it's not hard to kind of get that base. It's like, you want to be like a, what did they say? A jack of all trades, but master of one, okay. right? Like you got that understanding, but you got that one thing you're amazing at. Master of one, not none. You got one skill, oh, you but you know a bunch. Okay. You know okay. what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. We've got uh, the woman and then John, lady with the camera. <laughs> You know, where does the heavy metals end up? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a lot of the heavy metals have that dimalin cation of 2 plus, and it's very similar to uh, the nutrients of the elements that we need, like calcium. Mm -hmm. and so, unfortunately, and like uh, iron. So, unfortunately, where you find um, the nutritional iron, like leafy green vegetables, that's where you're also going to see uh, mm -hmm. the plant take up the heavy metals. And I, I did some. Um, research because I used to work for Cali PA. Mm. And um, yeah, until about 1999, it was legal for anybody, the steel galvanizing industry, to shunt their hazardous waste from the steel galvanizing industry that makes their metal shiny and pretty into fertilizer and without any labeling. Mm. And so I personally worked on that and um, you know, fought against our politicians who did not want that model change to basically have a loophole in the uh, health and safety code throughout the United States. So not until about 1999, that loophole was then eliminated. So mm -hmm. now they, can, they have to, uh, they, they now uh, cannot shut hazardous waste into fertilizers without labeling it. She um, could still do it. They can still do it. With labeling it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really great point. Thank you. Um, and um, mycelium mushrooms do the same thing, um, where they're basically mining for minerals in the soil. They're really, really good at updating minerals. Like, you know, I was talking about mycorrhizal fungi, and that's their special skill set, um, is, is actually accessing minerals that they can take plants. 
Um, and yeah, they're very similar to, and they'll take up the heavy metals as well. Um, and they also take up radioactive elements like cesium. Um, mm -hmm. It's a similar sort of process where they're, where they're taking that in um, and hyperaccumulating. I have a question about pesticides because I've had some, uh, I've had some field research on uh, finding alternatives to long past usage, ubiquitous usage of uh, herbicides uh, all over the United States, right? It's ubiquitous and throughout the world. And, you know, it, it occurred to me that having some type of filtration system you know, uh, with some type of uh, booms. I, I, I'm not familiar with the language so much. Mm -hmm. but so that, you know, first of all, I mean, I, I'm all for competitive planting, and we've uh, advocated for that in Contra Costa County, where I've done, you know, 16 years of most of the advocacy work. Um, they have started to do the, you know, competitive planting in the public works department. And also, uh, we've done field research showing that you can go right inside the creek water. Mm -hmm. and the, Contamination for the fecal coliform, it does not go downstream after about 100 feet. It gets absorbed into the sediment. Mm -hmm. So, we now this is sort of like a game changer where you know, before the public agencies were, were saying, you know, uh, we can't use goats, we can't use grazing because it's, it's going to cause erosion and, and also the fecal coliform is going to contaminate the water. We sh we've shown it, that's not true, and our study was replicated by. Uh, County Public Works Department, they got the same answer, mm. basically in a nutshell. And so I was also thinking, but it's a transition because, you know, large organizations are very slow to change. And I was just wondering, do you know if there's been any work done, pilot trials done, using um, fungi to, you know, yep. absorb Absolutely, um, yeah. For pesticides, not just uh, hydrocarbons. Yeah, well, I mean, there's been... For the actual pesticides, because a lot more for for, for particularly, um, and for pesticides. But there have been studies done where they're like, this mushroom is good with this pesticide because pesticides are these complex okay, chemicals. So mm-hmm. And you could try to train the mushroom. I can't think of any actual applications like field applications. But it doesn't mean it'd be worth Googling that or actually yeah. doing like a lit search because it absolutely might be done. Yeah. Because I've seen him talk about that piece. So, yeah, if you give us your contact info, I can try to send you some stuff. Yeah, and it might, there might be there. He is amazing. Final question, because I just want to be, and, and other people can stay after. We just don't want to hold people too long. Well, I just, I just think that um, one of the things that I noticed was that in some ways we've reversed the, the, um, the, the sequence of things sometimes. I'm, I'm wondering, are you trying with test sites in your community to What's missing is the financing in order to buy certain equipment, in order to finance movement of people, transportation of pulling people out of their communities to locate into one location in order to have these uh, training so programs. So I've done uh, projects in my own <laughs> laboratory. Um, we have a site ready. We have the permits. Um, so that site could become uh, 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 a micro and phyto that is, that is the goal, that these sites become training, uh, experimental and capacity building sites. And how would you handle the water, for instance? Where, how would so we? So people would have to eat food and drink water. Like if people came down to volunteer, is that what you're asking? Yeah, well people would go and volunteer, and you mm -hmm. also have the local people, but everybody would have to eat and drink. Mm -hmm. Um, right now, we don't work with volunteers, we just work with the locals and experts, international experts. Yeah. 
Um, yes, water and water and food are and transportation are all provided for the locals and for the internationals. Absolutely. I think it's also the place where she lives. Um, is also um, it has been a, a eco lodge too, so they Sixty-five thousand dollars for the project. It's not the last three years trying to find it. Yeah, but it isn't that much, like in terms of philanthropy and and grants. Is it possible? Is it possible to, you know, write a you know write an invoice? Basically, you do this, whatever it costs, you write the invoice and you send it to. Chevron. We just spent 27 years fighting Chevron. 20, 27 years in a legal lawsuit against Chevron. Why don't you just build it? Build it. Maybe you can help her build this. I don't know. As you saw, we've been at the shareholders' meetings. So year after year, we go to the Chevron meetings and bring it up. And then they go to Houston to avoid this or whatever. But I think there have been so many people working on it consistently, Rainforest Action Network, as you so, that that is not a bad idea. That <laughs> bill will get printed in the Chronicle. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I, think, I think what you have to realize is going to the stakeholder meeting or the Cheryl. shareholder meeting is probably cost you more than $65,000. And so if you if you can tell everybody, listen, let's just do it and bill them, you know, and shame them in, into paying the cost eventually. Now anyone who buys like two common shares can attend the shareholders meeting. Mm -hmm. There's been active campaigns on this for many. Are you wrapping us? You can't, you're cut, last call or we're done? The main thing is remediation. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, we're going to end this.